Welcome. May the demo gods be kind. Hi, I'm James Brundage. Welcome to Automating the Real World. In case you don't kind of know that much about me, here's a bit of background. I am James from Start Automating. Start Automating is actually one of the first PowerShell consultancies. Uh, we've been around for 12 years now. I've been doing PowerShell for 16 years. Those other four were spent on the team at Microsoft helping build PowerShell 2 and 3. I have been doing this a while. I like making a lot of useful tools and interesting toys with PowerShell. This talk is more in the toys category than the tools, just to be clear. I'm not expecting any of you to take this back to your work and get a promotion, but you might take this back home and do something nifty. I like to automate about anything that I can. Um, there was a guy on the uh, garage at Microsoft back in the day that used to say, James, if you could brush your teeth with PowerShell, you would. And I still don't really have a response to that. I, mean, I just haven't gotten around to it. It doesn't seem that efficient. But yeah, I, I like to automate what I can. Today we're going to talk about some of that real world automation. This has uh, been a bit of a hobby for a while. So, what is real world automation? Most PowerShell automation concerns computers or servers. For lack of a better way to put it, it's intangible and maybe a little boring. I don't know if anybody else has had that. What'd you do today? Oh, patched this, updated that, dealt with this incident, eyes gloss over, sort of reaction. So real world automation automates tangible things. And we're going to cover a few of them today. High level, Internet of Things devices are a great thing to be considering for real world automation. If you already have one, great. You can see if it has an API and you can see how you play with it. Another one we're going to cover today is multimedia. Uh, this might not necessarily seem as real world until you can, can kind of consider all of the places that you see, well, screens not showing a console on them. In fact, uh, one of the things that you could do with some of the toolkit that you have here is build what we've got in the lobby, where you have try screens panning through different parts of a video. Another thing I'm going to briefly touch on here is 3D printing. Um, if you have a tool chain to be able to automate, you can actually create actual physical devices from a bit of PowerShell code. It's kind of crazy. These open up a lot of new possibilities for the PowerShell language and let us optimize our lives. I'm going to cover the first part a little bit before I get into how life can get better. PowerShell is a great language. In about any space that it's come to, it's revolutionized it fairly quickly. And one of my personal goals as a PowerShell developer over time has been to broaden the pie of PowerShell, to take it to more and more places, make more and more viable careers for us all. So by opening up some of these doors, I hope we can all walk through them, take them interesting places, do interesting things. But we're going to start with just some life optimization. So how can we make life better with IoT? Well, let's start with lighting. Quick show of hands, how many people have smart lights? OK. <laughs> That's a good showing. Automating your own lighting can help your circadian rhythms. It is also cool. I mean, you don't necessarily need to start off this just to make your day a little bit better, but yeah, it will. Uh, in fact, actually, one of the beautiful ironies of this talk and its demo prep is that I was hoisted on my own petard as I was working at 2.30 in the morning, getting my demos all ready, and my light shut off because that's the point I programmed in to say, this is absolutely too late, go to bed. <laughs> in fact, actually at home, like my lights will slowly dim down several times through the evening to the point that at about 2.30, I'm kind of generally having trouble staying awake just from light levels. So there's a lot of really subtle hacking you can do to have change your life this way. It can also be really contextually useful at home or work. Uh, one of the things that I do very often is set a timer and make it blink. 
but you can also change colors and for time or location to make any room into a progress bar. I've seen people basically set a 30 minute timer, change the brightness over that timer or change the color over that timer to control their workout schedule. Lots of things you can do. You can also set those short timers. They can let you know when the meeting is done or the oven is done or the meeting is over. That's handy. Uh, really, really nice actually if you're going to put something in the oven and zone out for a while. It's a lot harder to miss every light in your place flashing than it is to miss an alarm. So your mileage and imagination may vary. These are just some of the examples that I've personally already done. Um, you can do whatever you'd like. I'd be interested in hearing what some of you want to do. If you start to script it, ideas will come. Like if you've got a smart light, and this is already an ecosystem supported by the module that I'm gonna show you later, then great, please. By all means, play around, see what you can do. But before we get into fun, let's set some realistic expectations. So how many people had a smart light again? How many people have tried to program that smart light? How's it been? More, most IoT IEPIs could use a fairly substantial amount of work. Each device and ecosystem will be unique. Quality will vary significantly. Uh, I am actually not going to show off some of the nastier ones here. I will just allude to them. I would very strongly recommend for you to research APIs before you buy. If you can't find any documentation online, please, please don't waste your money on a device you're not gonna be able to automate. Also understand that for the moment, Two really popular paths to automation are not open to us. They won't stay that way forever, but right now it is a big pain in the butt to do Bluetooth and PowerShell and to do MQTT and PowerShell. If you have answered that pain in the butt, please see me after. I will happily take PRs. You also should be prepared to reverse engineer. Most of the examples that you're gonna run into are not going to be in PowerShell. They're either going to be in, if it's an HTTP API, something like brief curl snippets, or if you're less lucky, hey, some random guy or person wrote a Python library or Ruby library, and you're going to figure out how that actually translates to invoke rest method or equivalents. So, let me know if you need any help. This is again a personal passion space for me. If uh, you want help, I'm happy to provide it. So now that we've kind of added enough caveats to scare most people away, let's talk about automating lighting. Again, how do we do it? It's a per device speed up. <laughs> I've supported, or I've scripted support for these ecosystems and I'm kind of gonna walk down how painful they are. Philips Hue, who has Philips Hue? Okay, cool. So a few of you are already good to go. This is decently documented, mostly logical, and clearly built by electricians. Like, not people that actually really understand development. I've also got Nanoleaf support. These are semi-decently documented, highly illogical, and also built by electricians. You might kind of be sensing a pattern here, but it does actually get worse. Um, Twinkly, which I think is one of the more interesting product names I've run into over the years, is a uh, smart Christmas lighting system that is horribly documented, unsupported, and it's built in a way that has nothing to do with the app. So you're gonna be trying to figure out how to you know, reproduce what you did in the app and you're basically going to find yourself scratching your head a lot. Good news for everybody, these are all sunk costs. Again, I've already figured these out. You can already play with them. You can file an issue rather than actually have to wade through it all yourself. Yay. <laughs> Last, and actually least, is Divoom devices. Uh, Pixus in particular, these are the 
64 by 64 Wi-Fi pixel screens that have some clocks, have some extra functionality, and honestly have possibly the worst API I've run into yet. Uh, it's a Kickstarter funded thing. It's out of Hong Kong. The API is barely findable through search. You have to really get your Google flu in order to get there. And it has wonderful conventions like posting to a command slash get to get pieces of information. This is really frustratingly common actually in this sort of API, but it will drive you insane. So please use tooling if available, and if you are not using tooling, expect, I don't know, the muck's probably gonna go up to about here, maybe there, it, it's not gonna be a fun day. Contributors have also added support for Elgato Keylight, and you know, that one actually looks simple enough. Granted, it can only change color temperature, but it looks simple enough. Now, in case all of this didn't make it clear, since the APIs really aren't easy, we need to abstract them. And now we get to the first fun module of the day, and that would be LightScript. LightScript is a PowerShell module for automating lighting. You can get to it at github.com slash start automating LightScript. I'm going to go pop that open in a tab, come back to it later. You can also install module LightScript, scope current user, force. So on the gallery now, actually put up new bits last night, in case the late night story didn't make that clear. You can use Connect, Hubridge, Nanoleaf, Pixu, or Twinkly to connect your lights. Uh, individual authentication will vary if you have a hue. You're going to basically need to go over, press the button on the link bridge, then connect to your bridge. If you have Nanoleaf, you're going to need to press the button on the Nanoleaf. If you have Twinkly or Pixu, they have, um, politely put, interesting bad assumptions about authentication. Uh, Pixu has none. Twinkly has an API token that is provisioned for one client at a time. So when you're trying to figure out what's going on in the app, you're trying to figure out what's going on in your computer, and doing one disables the other, and then doing the other disables the first. So you have to keep getting yourself new tokens all the time, which is not fun. But again, really easy if you have a module to do it. You can use find X, Y, or Z to locate IP addresses, or you can look them up in your app. Uh, there is, at this point, Find Hubridge, find Nanoleaf, and find Twinkly, I believe. Uh, Pixu shows its IP in the app. It doesn't provide a standard discoverability protocol, so not much to do about that. It's really not the best of all commands at this point. It's also in a room for growth. The find commands to locate devices use SSDP, and unfortunately, sorry, currently only work on Windows PowerShell, not Core. Working on it. So that's the high level command set of what you've got just to kind of get connected to your devices. Then you have basically get and set for each of the devices. What you can do with the set tends to vary. In a few of the cases, you have an underlying send command to be able to directly interact with the REST API if it has some complexities in authentication. You can also basically have a cache connection so that once you're set up, you're completely good to go. And that's mostly it. Now we get to the kind of raw demo form of LightScript. You might notice that there aren't a bunch of smart lights here. There's also not 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. So demonstrating this in person is not gonna be possible. Also, see my late night. I do not have the dream demo set up. I have quick demos of what was done and the scripts to do them. So let's go grab them actually. I need to load up Outlook for a second to grab the script. And I'll also throw up the first of the videos. 
Uh, what do you all want to see first? Hue or Nanoleaf? Hue. 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 Okay. Uh, all right. Let's see if this goes to the right monitor. Well, of course it didn't. I actually have other things that I could use for that, but I'm going to be simple for the moment. One second. Sorry for the quality, it's a hard thing to record. Um, I will bring up the script that we're demoing in just a second and walk you through each of the steps. I did a little source control with it via SMTP this morning, so here's what we're going to be doing. I'm going to point out some things before we get into there. Uh, one, and this is something we're going to cover more in the uh, more game-breaking PowerShell talk, is the use of smart aliasing inside of LightScript. Um, smart aliases are when you make aliases that point to a command that is smart enough to determine what the command name was and thus what it should do. In this case, it's actually pretty easy to understand. Uh, instead of basically always making you set hue light, I alias set hue light to the names of each room and each fixture that I discover. So I can just say, hey, turn on the lights in the sunroom. Make them brighter. Dim them over a few seconds. Change the color temperature. Make the room pink. Make it blue, turn off a light, turn on a light, and transition over time. One thing I'm gonna point out before I actually go show the video is that uh, there are a lot of major differences, generally speaking, between what the device APIs can do and what the apps can do. Um, Hue does not have the worst app. It certainly does not have the best one. Uh, it limits itself in how long you can transition. So if you wanted to set up an effect in your Hue bridge on your app, you can, I think, do a maximum of 15 minutes. The API supports 45 minute transitions. So you can slowly change color to color at a degree that's almost imperceptible to people around you. And it actually really helps that whole circadian rhythm automation because you're not sitting there saying, oh, it's suddenly darker. It's just slowly sunsetting inside. Okay, so a couple more things than that. We're gonna also show the flashing lights just once. If you wanted to make them blink 10 times, you can use L select as the alert, not select. Of course, there's tab completion. You can also set a color loop and clear that color loop. And this is where we get to my embarrassment because I was going to add nice text to all these demos, but instead you're going to get to see a uh, about a minute of lights changing. Maybe. And also my camera not liking that lights change. Sorry, it's a real pain to demo these sorts of things uh, live, so apologies for that. There, we're going up in brightness and changing color temperatures. We should be getting to a few more changes soon. One other thing to note is it's taking about five seconds to go through each of them. I really did have nice ideals for auto-titling this whole thing, but case raw, raw, you don't really get everything done at three or four in the morning. What? Especially if your lights are turned off. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. Uh, I also would say that it, it is a little naturally tiring to like have them cycling like that just for testing purposes, but again, there you go. We've got that, I think that was the three second transition. I think we're gonna next go to them turning off. Oh no, that's the longer transition. That's the color temperature, and then we should have a couple more and be done. Oh, no, we're done. Okay, so that's Hue or at least as demonstrable as I can make you in this sort of a context. 
Let's go through NanoLeaf. Not a similar structure to our scripts, but it will look a little bit cooler. So first, we're going to change the color temperature to 1999, because, you know, I like to party like it. We're going to set an effect, then we're going to change it to a particular hue, saturation, and brightness. We're going to set it to fade between a couple of colors. We're going to flow between a couple of colors. These are different effects on the device. Does anyone else in here own a NanoLeaf? Okay, we know which is the more popular system. Does anyone own a, any twinkly lights? Does anyone own a Pixu? Okay, clearly I have a problem. Cool. <laughs> um, oh, at least one. But thank you. We all have problems. So, we're going to go flow between these two colors. We're going to switch the direction of the flow to go downward. By default, it will flow left to right. We're going to make a color wheel. We're going to change the rotation of that wheel and make it rotate very slowly. We're going to set up some RGB-based fireworks, and then we're going to make that RGB-based fireworks show very fast. When you have a delay time of one and trans time of one, it's basically when there's audio, flash effect, then stop. I will also be somewhat kind to you and come back to this in a half second, but the video clips that you're seeing have had audio sliced out. We're going to cover how as we get to the next bit. But now that we've shown Hugh off, let's go show some Nana Leaf. And a bit of a desktop monitor in the bottom. Yes, truly this is one of the uh, worst things to try to record a demo for on your camera. So, get to see a lot of what's happening, but every time it switches, you basically have to refuzz it or refocus. So. Yeah, uh, I mean, all due respect to that comment and myself, I need to uh, record demos a week ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, thank you for the feedback. So that's that fireworks effect, and I think we're about to see it get a little bit more hectic in the last few seconds. Yeah. Again, these are cool devices, fun toys. Uh, Hue does support screen mirroring. Um, Nanoleaf does as well, but only to desktop. Does anybody, has anybody experienced this or no? Anybody got a sync box? Okay. Uh, this is definitely in the cool category, although it is also a bit of life improvement. But uh, you can, with smart lighting systems like Hue, you can actually create an entertainment area, plug it into the television, and have what's on the TV and its common lights basically spread throughout your room. I don't know how much Netflix all of you have watched in the last few years. Probably a bit. I would say that it has made the home theater experience for me better than the movie theater experience. Uh, very immersive. Also, kind of terrifying if you're watching horror. Just saying. So those are a couple of quick light script demos. And again, here's the script that generated that last one. And you can see all that I'm basically doing to create that video was hitting record after hitting F5 and sleeping, doing a thing, sleeping, doing a thing. This is a very, very rudimentary form of scheduling, but you could obviously use something like Task Scheduler if you'd like. Hue supports its own schedules. There are commands in LightScript to manage those. So you can uh, add Hue Schedule, get Hue Schedule, remove Hue Schedule. You can also do rule-based lighting. So you can say, when a motion sensor trips, go increase the brightness in this room. All sorts of fun things. Uh, in kind of fun crazy, they sell uh, the motion sensor. There's also a light meter and a temperature gauge. So I can basically have my lighting in my home 
when it's cold out, become warmer. I cannot understate all the beautiful, wonderful ways you can trick your brain with this sort of stuff. Um, I'm still only scratching the surface, honestly. But while I could talk through lighting through most of this time, I don't think that's going to be the most fun given the quality of those couple of demos. So we're going to move on from there to another thing that I can allude to and not demo. Scripting some televisions. OK. You got all your lights set up. You set it up so that everything is one color and your TV's still on. Congratulations, your TV is way brighter than every single light you have in your room and whatever motif you were going for is kind of gone. So I got to figure out how to script TV, right? If I want to actually get a fully synchronized home space here, clearly I got to control the biggest fixture. My current recommendation is getting a Roku TV or other Roku device. This is not a very heavy bias. We'll get to some of the why shortly. And basically, it's Roku's ECP. They have a public test API. This is enabled by default on every Roku. It's kind of interesting. I'm going to go take a look at its docs for a second. And actually, I'm going to go bring up some other tabs while we're here, just because I alluded to it and didn't, you know, really come back to it. So let's take a look just side by side at how bad some of these APIs are. So that's Roku, and uh, got the other couple and a couple of tabs here. This mess is Nanoleaf. Oh. No, that mess is Nanoleaf. Yeah. At least it's documented. <laughs> you, you know? <laughs> Let me actually flip back over to the other tab here. They say it's an open API, but there is not an open API spec. False advertising, man. The other thing to kind of note is that both Hue and Nanoleaf are behind uh, service agreement walls. Oh, sure, you're, you're not going to do anything too terrible with our APIs. Yeah, we'll give you your email just so we can get the developer documentation. This is strangely common in electronics and deeply frustrating because why would you do that to your API? You're just limiting the number of people that can use it. Uh, Hue is also messy. Let's go to a few of the different APIs in there. Again, at least it's documented. And this one, to be fair, is somewhat decently documented. It's also still very much built by electricians. Like, uh, raise your hand if you've ever calculated color in XY color space. <laughs> Let the record show that there are no hands, and including mine. I'm still like, just give me two values. I'm not, I'm, no. Uh, how many people here are familiar with hue saturation and brightness math? Anybody good at color space conversions? Give me an RGB color, get back HSP. Yeah. There's at this point stuff built into LightScript to do that. Uh, but if you were planning on doing this yourself, you'd have some, some work to do. This is also true for ECP, but it's also like programming with a hand behind your back. You can discover ECP with SSTP which is uh, basically a way to find plug and play devices. And it can do a few things. Well, I can find out where I'm at in the media player. I can press a key down, press a key up, actually fully press a key, get device info, get app info, get some channel perf information on newer devices, get some bitmaps and sync nodes on newer devices, 
and send input to an application and search. Realistically, search is the one that you will end up using for somewhat normal purposes. Uh, if you wanted to take an example of where this is practically painful, um, I can really easily mute or unmute my television. I cannot tell you what the volume is. And so even if I am trying to actually turn up the volume to 100, well, do I just key press volume up 100 times? How do I? All right, you're, you're now at 75. You want volume to be 50. How do I do that? Do I press 75 volume downs and then 50 volume ups? Yeah, it leaves a bit to be desired. Now, long term, if we get into all the other fun stuff, Roku, which I have not yet, you could build your own channel, do whatever you'd like. All you need to do is learn their bad programming language. But they have something, and something is better than nothing. It is not a good API. If your television has a better one, please let me know. Has anybody else in here hacked their TV? Shucks. Oh, one. What kind of TV? Okay, let's talk after. It is pretty easy to authenticate. So, you know, one thing in ECP is kind of credit. Of course, it being easy to authenticate means that this is also creepy. How many people have a family? How many people have a family and have Rokus? How many people would like to uh, be aware if their kid was watching stuff late? Totally doable. You can big brother your child if you'd like. But, you know, they can probably big brother you back. So, consider there aren't any Rokus here, except for the ones that are not enabled on the network upstairs, which even if I could change anything, you couldn't see. No, not going to demo Power Roku. Just going to mention it. Sorry. I did highlight some of the TV-specific features already, I think. Uh, if not, let me go import my module and check that out. Give me a second. Because honestly, PowerRoku is the weakest of this bunch, so... So I cannot actually get any Rokus right now, but I can get Roku-Syntax. So TV-specific features, you can get the list of channels, change the active channel, or get the active channel, get the active apps, get green savers and themes. You can also send Roku to send Full text, key down, key up, key press, volume up, volume down, changing the tuner, changing the AEB input. And honestly, that last part is kind of all I need. Like, realistically, to my original problem space, I don't need to control the TV that much. I just need to tell it to change over to an HDMI input of my own control, right? So, that last one there, that's the one that I'd be using. If you've got Roku TVs, you can also do the same, and then you can basically plug it into a device of your choosing and party on. That brings us to Rough Draft. Uh, how many people at this conference have I already mentioned Rough Draft to? Okay, a few. How many uh, people did I mention it to over the years that it was kind of hanging out on the shelf? Now, I need to hype more. All right. Rough Draft is a module for multimedia. It's built on top of FFmpeg. Who knows FFmpeg? Who likes FFmpeg? 
I rest my case. FFmpeg is a ludicrously powerful multimedia toolkit. It is also obscenely arcane and could greatly benefit from tab completion. Like, really, really needs it. Rough Draft organizes multimedia scenarios into several extensible dash media commands. Now, I'll briefly touch on extensibility in this talk, assuming we still have the time for it. But it's a really cool technique to allow a bit of a script to apply to one or more functions. And since one of the key things, if you understand a little bit of FFmpeg, is, well, this set of input parameters will control whether I'm converting or editing or joining a number of videos or audio files together, and this other larger batch of things will be what filters I'm applying to them. Being able to cleanly separate those and have those filters apply to multiple different commands, that's very handy. This lets us fill out the functionality of FFmpeg without too much trouble. I already have a bit of it loaded here, so let's just get an idea of how much functionality. Oh, I gotta keep remembering that uh, this does not have a module path correctly. Because after too many years of developing for Windows PowerShell, I still keep my module path that way. Anyway. Um, Let's go ahead and get command module rough draft. Nice, relatively short command list. Easy enough. Get a sense of how much stuff is in there with dash syntax. Some of these have a bit, just, just a tad. Uh, let me get my mouse over there. Oh, let's actually just look at edit media, for example. Edit media at this point has the most filters supported. That's probably too many to see. So let's do this the other PowerShell way and go ahead and see. I don't remember exactly what the parameter count is. How many do I have? Oh, not compare. 249 parameters. Uh, let me actually re, uh, no, I already re-import. I don't know if I get pulled on this one recently. Let's double check. Just make sure I'm on main. I thought I had a bit more. Yeah, I'm on main. Nothing new. I am wrong then. Say lovey. Don't worry, it'll be growing soon. Uh, let's have some fun here for a second and kind of first start off by showing how I got the demo to strip out its audio. Um, so just to torture you all for a second. If I can never get my mouse over there. I uh, have the great view from being at the edge of Capitol Hill in South Lake Union and the bad audio from living at the edge of I-5. I'm sorry. That's what that sounded like. Wouldn't have made for the best experience for everybody. So if you want a real simple script, you could actually do with Rough Draft very easily. In fact, I did this prior to the demo. Go split out the media here into just having no audio. So there we go, knock out one stream. There's also, of course, no video. If I really just wanted to go to sleep to that sort of traffic-y sound, you know, real great white noise generator. One other fun thing that uh, I did kind of heading up towards here, which looks like it finished up, is I took my drive out here, um, Fairly recently got Tesla, it has dash cams in there, you can take a USB stick of the recordings. They will come out with basically a number of different camera from this angle, MP4s, just kind of split in an arbitrary time. And this part's quick enough that I can just go ahead and re-demo it. But I can go ahead and take all of that. Well, 
I can redemo it and have the demo book gods be a little kind, unkind. Let's see if it's loaded in there. There we go. Okay. So run that selection. It's figuring out, hey, uh, are these all video files? Are these all audio files? What am I dealing with? Okay, they're all video files. They're all the same codec. Boom. So I'm not going to make you wait for whatever number of minutes to show you the whole thing. But I will kind of highlight the next one and then bring up the video for there. I can actually speed it up. Or should be able to. I actually haven't viewed the video yet, so I'm sorry if the demo gods are cruel to me. Remove the audio and resize it to make it a little bit smaller. We'll come back to that show media in a second. Okay. So doing that. Actually, you know what? I'm keeping my demo in-house here. I'm going to say show media input path home videos Tesla combined. 25x. And it's probably going to do this on the wrong screen. Yes, it is. So let's drag it over there. And see how kind the demo gods were to me. Are you just, is everybody looking and critiquing by following distance here for a second? Thank you. You know. So all the way up to here. Okay, then I'm going to have to get into lightning mode here for a second. So that one's fun. There's one other kind of quick demo I was going to show here, which is that you can list the capture devices. And I'm going to set up a quick little Funhouse mirror, so I'm going to show media, direct show, sorry for my color scheme here, and uh, direct show video device is Microsoft camera rear, yeah, it looks like it's uh, putting that over there, so let's Give that a better view to everybody here for a second. Uh, there we go. Kind of redundant because I'm going to need to do this again in another sec because I'm going to add some effects to it and make it a bit of a funhouse mirror. So I'm going to edge detect and I'm going to, uh, yeah, let's, let's just do edge detect and a mirror. <coughs> And so, yeah, there, there's, there's our little funhouse mirror of the room. Sorry if you're not on the side currently being displayed. Uh, quick, you know, example of what's in there. Since I don't have that many minutes left and I've got to kind of run into overdrive here, I'm going to get back to the slide deck and kind of blast on through. Uh, I will cover more of Rough Draft tomorrow. You can ask me more about it later. It's a fun module. We already did that. I'll take a look at the extensions and questions afterwards. So we did the demo. This one, I'm sorry, I'm not going to have the time to go into that much. There's a new module out there for you called PS3D. It will allow you to basically do CICD around 3D printing in PowerShell. So you can have an open SCAD design, get all of its customizations, provide some new ones, get out an STL, get out a PNG if you want. Real nice. And like with Rough Draft, we're building on top of tools that exist. Uh, again, sorry for the bit of the rush, but you know, only so much time. Open SCAD is a programming language for 3D design, in case you're not aware of it. It's real useful. I was going to say fun, but that would be a lie. It allows you to create customizable designs and save those customizations. And again, we can actually now work with that in PowerShell as well. We're not going to show off PS3D. 
now we have a couple of fun other bonus rounds. Places that you can run PowerShell that you might not expect. This one's obvious, PowerShell and Raspberry Pis. Going back to how I actually completely control my TV, that's real easy. PowerShell works on a Raspberry Pi. Come back to that in a second. PowerShell does work on a Raspberry Pi and I can basically control the Raspberry Pi remotely to display whatever I would like on my actual television. There are instructions to get it set up on Raspberry Pi. They are for the wrong architecture. If there's anybody from the Microsoft team here, please fix that. <laughs> Raspberry Pi plus rough draft plus HDMI output is basically full control of your screen or just the world's fanciest photo frame, if you want. PowerShell and light, or Pi and light script together means that you have a little lighting board. Uh, I don't know if anybody has ever actually done professional lighting, but those things get really expensive. So it will be cheaper. Not going to get to demo this one yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. But Pi plus PowerShell plus Tesla is an onboard computer that is beyond Elon Musk's control. Also, who knew you could run PowerShell on Android's phones? Oh, okay, cool. Userland will let you run Linux on Android and then you can install PowerShell, but again, you have that same architecture problem. In this case, more logically, because most of the people running Debian are running on x86, x64, but hey, yeah, you can actually you know, run it on ARM. So after you change your architecture, you're good to go on that one. So these are two really interesting places that I'm looking forward to exploring more. Android phones, unfortunately, look like they're going to be a little less useful for this just because the user lambda is a little limited. But these are a couple of other places you can play with PowerShell that you might not expect. I think we got one more. What else will be automated or am I looking at automating? You can always give me new ideas. This is a fairly new passion and new space. These are a few things on my near-term radar, because again, I need help. One is the Bond app, which is a way to control IR signals and receive and record them. Sure, I could do this with IR Blaster as well, but they actually have a REST API, so I will try it. I'm going to be building out more Raspberry Pi and microcomputer end-to-end -end scenarios. It's great to be able to tell you you can use it as a fancy photo frame. I'm sure you'd all love to download a package. The other thing that would be fantastic is multi-device lighting control. The innards of this are already there in LightScript. I've already kind of described how immersive having smart lighting plus it synced to your TV can be. Well, imagine that being true for every fixture. And I'm getting the must done, be done now, so multi-screen mirroring, Tesla, and long-term, if you have Bluetooth scripts, MQTT scripts, or HTTP MU scripts, hit me up. I'm always open to new ideas. And I think I don't actually have time to hear what you think today. <laughs> Just <laughs> so uh, come back later. <laughs> Happy scripting. <laughs>